Geoglitch and welcome back to Geoglitch Ministries or welcome to Geoglitch Ministries if it is your first time. I hope you find today's sermon enjoyable but more so I hope you find it edifying and even convicting. If you are a non-believer I hope you stick around and I hope that God uses this sermon in your life to bring you to the faith. God bless and enjoy. So uh, just a little bit over a week ago, we started our study through the book of Hosea with Hosea chapter 1 verse 1. Then we took a bit of time to do the book of Jude. We put a pause on Hosea straight away and then we took a bit of time to do the book of Jude, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And now we are getting back into the book of Hosea doing chapter 1 verse 2. And I think it's quite interesting in... So far in my study through Luke and in my study through Jude, I have found no end of resources in terms of sermons and so on and so forth about those two books. Um, When it comes to Hosea, I can find maybe one sermon on it and you know, a fair few commentaries. But it's interesting just to see how, you know, some books I think are left behind a bit. And, you know, it's fair enough. There are 66 books in the Bible. You can never hope to preach through the entire Bible in your entire life. Um, especially if you are doing, you know, one or two services a week. So I suppose I have a bit of an advantage there where I can do like three or four in a week, depending on how fast I am and, you know, all of that stuff and how busy I am. But in my research, I found, I think, one sermon of Hosea 1, 1 to 3. So I might be the first person in human history to do Hosea 1, 1 by itself and Hosea 1, 2 by itself. Now, I know, I know I'm not the first person in history to do that. Um, but my ego's big, so I'm just going to pretend I am. Joking, obviously. Anyway, I'm just talking nonsense at this stage. So, yeah, we're going to be studying Hosea 1, chapter 1, verse 2. So we will read the verse and then we will get into it. Hosea 1, 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Here we see a few things. Obviously, the um, immediate thing that you're immediately drawn to is probably that bit at the end of the verse. Go have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Well, what's this in reference to? Well, it's in reference to idolatry. People say, that, yeah, sure, this this God, I mean, yeah, he, he, he created all of us. Yeah, he's helped us innumerable times. Yeah, he stayed with us despite our many failings. Yes, he rescued us out of Egypt. Yes, he literally made food fall from the sky on a number of occasions. But that statue looks pretty cool. Uh, and that's basically the, the whole sort of mindset behind it. You have a God who has promised you many things and has either kept his promise or hasn't kept his promise not because he's not keeping his promise but because he hasn't fulfilled it yet so a god who makes two kinds of promises the kind of promise he has fulfilled and the kind of promise he's going to fulfill but never the kind of promise he's never going to fulfill and then you have other gods who don't even make promises but people pretend they do and then because the gods don't exist and never made the promises they don't keep the promises and those are the gods people keep going to. And I think this is a good uh, indication, a good example of the fallenness of man. The unfortunate truth of man's state is that we will always choose, or maybe not always, but nine times out of ten, when left to our own devices, we will choose the more sinful option. Now, sometimes we might not because, you know, total depravity means man is depraved all over. Every part of him is depraved. It doesn't mean he's as depraved as he could be. Everyone has redeeming qualities. It doesn't mean they're good. It just means they're not as bad as they could be. You think if anybody throughout history, Hitler, Stalin, they're not good people, but they're not as bad as they could be. No, that's not me saying, oh, they weren't that bad. They were horrible but we can conceive of them being worse. Um, not a reality we want to live, live in, but we can conceive of it. And so people, when left to their own devices, 
Sure, sometimes they might give a bit of money to that homeless fella, sometimes they might do this or that nice thing, but most of the time we do choose the more sinful option. And a lot of the time when we're when people aren't saved, they don't realise it's the sinful option because a lot of the time in the modern world, the sins that people are committing are the sins of whoredom, abandoning the one true God for false gods. And that's very harsh language that's being used here. And I think as we go through the book of Hosea, uh, we're going to see the harshness of God. And that's not something we like to talk about today. We love talking about how loving and great and all that stuff that he is. And he's great and he's loving. We don't like to talk about when he's harsh. But he is when he needs to be. He's not overly harsh or mean or cruel or anything like that. But when the time calls for it, he's harsh. And he's harsh here. He doesn't simply say, my people have left me, and leave it at that. He calls them whores. You abandoned me for other gods. You are a whore. You're as bad as a whore. That's strong language. You abandoned me for other gods. You are as bad as the woman who stands the street corner trying to get the attention of lonely men. You're a whore, and you've committed whoredom. And that's the symbolism, of course, behind Gomer, behind Hosea's wife, as we're going to learn about um, next time, from verse 3 and onwards. Jose, um, Gomer was a, was a whore. And so uh, God said, Hosea, you have to go marry a whore. And I guess Hosea, don't know what kind of a life he was living, just goes, you know what, God, I know just the woman. But... No, maybe I'm looking too much into it. I don't know. We don't know what much about Hosea's life before this. Maybe he was someone who engaged in that sort of a thing. Maybe not. I don't know. What I do know is the majority of the people were active in this time or alive at this time, supposedly God's people, were whores. They may not have been giving themselves sexually to anything that moved, but they were giving themselves spiritually to anything that didn't. If you made a statue good enough for a God with enough false promises, sinful man followed. And we see that today. Um, and there's, there's really two types of false gods. There is the invented character and the real life thing so the invented character being characters from other religions buddha well i'm not sure actually if buddha was a real person or not whoever the buddhist worship um allah and so on all these different uh different false gods and then there's the other type which is real things not real gods real things alcohol it's a real thing it's a god it's not a real god Money, sex, power. Some of these things are material, some of them are not material. But they're real things, um, not necessarily in the material sense, but they are things that you can either aim for, they are objectives, they are standards, or they are things you can consume or things you can have. And if you chase those things, instead of God... You're a whore. And that's the horrible nature with false gods, is they're taking something wonderful and perverting it. The idea of a god is a wonderful thing, so long as it's the one true god. But people take the idea of a god, they keep the god part, they get rid of the one true part. So people following gods, but they're false gods. And then with the other type, sex is a wonderful gift from God, but it's been perverted. Alcohol, there's nothing wrong with alcohol. It can be a wonderful thing as well when used properly. Jesus drank alcohol, he drank wine. Paul advised one of his friends when they were sick to have a little wine to help them with the pain. It can be a wonderful and even useful thing when used properly. Money is a gift, I believe. It helps us, it runs the economy. Make sure we can afford to feed ourselves, make sure everything is ordered. We made money the centre of everything. We made money rule our lives. We made it so that if you get enough money, the law basically doesn't apply to you. 
I'm not going to go and rant about the elite and all that stuff. I know you don't want to hear it. But the truth is that people with a lot of money aren't playing by the same rules as people with not quite so much money. That doesn't mean money is bad. It means man's bad. And he's taken this thing which is anywhere between fair enough, it's okay, and just kind of neutral. And they've turned it evil. Or they've used it for evil. People say money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. They think it's from the Bible. It's not. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. The object itself is fine. The paper, the coin you hold in your hand, that's fine. It's what's in your heart that matters. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Sex is not a sin when done properly in the marriage covenant. Whoredom is a sin. Drinking alcohol a little bit here if you're out celebrating, if it's a party, Jesus drank at a party. It's fine. But Jesus didn't get drunk. He didn't overindulge. He didn't get intoxicated. He knew his limit. He drank within his limit. He likely enjoyed himself. People don't do that. They drink too much. Some of them become alcoholics. The love of alcohol, the love of sex, the love of money. And the hate of God. The hatred towards God that so many of us have. And God calls those people's whores. I think something we're going to see throughout our study of Hosea is the parts of the character of God which are just as fabulous and wonderful and fantastic and lovely and beautiful and majestic as his love and kindness and mercy. But they're the characters of God, the characteristics of God that people don't like talking about because even though they're just as perfect as every other one of his characteristics, they're not nice to listen to. We don't like hearing about God's wrath, even though it is wonderful and perfect. We don't like hearing about how he's holy and glorious. We just want to hear about how he's just sort of nice. He's just a nice fella. We see the wrath of God, or the anger of God at least, I think, throughout Hosea. But that's the end of the verse. We will go back to the start and I suppose the middle as well. So if we go to the start of the verse, we see God is speaking to Hosea for the first time. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea. So, of course, he probably didn't just pick out Hosea. Hosea was there tending to his garden one day, stands up. The Lord has said, I imagine God probably communicated to be with Hosea beforehand, as he did with Moses. God spoke through Moses for the first time in Egypt, but he spoke to him up on the mountain before that. So I imagine God probably communicated in some way with Hosea before using him as a mouthpiece. I could be wrong, but I believe that that's what happened. And I think that this shows that up until this point in Hosea's life, he would not have been a prophet. He wasn't a prophet. This was the first time he prophesied. But this was also the first time he himself was hearing from the Lord especially. Obviously he had some books in the Bible. He, had, he would have had access to the books of Moses and some of the other books. But this is the first time he gets his own personal divine revelation. And then has to go and give that revelation to the, uh, to the people. And I can only imagine his excitement when this happened. He, Hosea. Some random fella of little to no significance was being spoken to directly from the Lord God Almighty. And he must have been very anxious. He must have wondered a few things. He must have wondered, what was God going to say? Is he going to call on me to do something great like Moses? Is he going to punish me for my sins? Is he going to end my life as I know it, or just end my life? Is he angry with me, happy with me, maybe? Or maybe Hosea was in such shock that none of these thoughts could race through his mind. 
Perhaps he could think of nothing, or perhaps all he could do was think of how wonderful and glorious God is. We don't know. What we do know is that God had a task for Hosea. He wanted Hosea to marry a prostitute. The Bible doesn't tell us how Hosea reacted to this news in the emotional sense. It doesn't tell us whether or not he was happy with the task. Um, now we know some people like Moses argued with God upon God telling them to go do something. And people like Jonah even did everything they could to avoid it, including like running away. So perhaps that was what Hosea did at first. Maybe not run away, but maybe he argued. We don't know. But we do know that whether immediately or after some coaxing, Hosea did as he was asked. And personally, I believe that he did it pretty much immediately. Hosea did what God told him uh, to do. And I don't think there was much pushback from Hosea. I think this shows us then that Hosea knew something about God that a lot of people today don't seem to realise. Or at the very least don't like to talk about. And that is, God is good, even when the things that happen to us don't seem to be. God in his sovereignty rules over all things. That includes those things in our lives that we would consider good, as well as those things in our lives that we would consider bad. Jose was asked to marry a prostitute, a whore. I can't imagine this was something which filled him with glee. Waking up in the morning going, or waking up the next morning going, today is the day I get to do it. But he did it anyway. He knew that this was part of God's plan and that even though he really didn't like what was going on, it was something that was being done in the fulfilment of God's good plan. We go to Genesis for a moment. We'll be we'll read one verse in a bit. Before we get there, we have to do some summarizing. And it's towards the end of the book I want us to go, where we will see the story of a man called Joseph. Now, Joseph, his life was pretty up and down, but there was a fair chunk of his life that was pretty dire. First, his brothers conspired to kill him. There's the first down, and he was only saved because of his many brothers. Only one didn't want him dead. There's, a suppose, a slight up. His brother instead convinced the others to throw Joseph down a large hole so that he could come back later and get him. So Joseph went down the hole, but before his brother could come and get him, some other people came along. They got Joseph out before swiftly sending him into slavery. From there, he actually managed to live a pretty decent life for a while. Uh, he, through a series of events, which I won't get into here, managed to get himself into a pretty high place of authority. Then, another man's wife lied about him, which meant that he was sent to prison. She really fancied Joseph. Uh, Joseph didn't fancy her back. She tried to corner him. Joseph fled. She went out and told a lie because he'd left his coat behind. So she went out, brought the coat and told a lie about him. And everyone was like, oh yeah, this sounds legit. And then he gets thrown into prison. And so he was thrown in with two other men. And these men had dreams. And they wanted them interpreted. And so Joseph interpreted the dreams for them. And he said that the one man would be restored to his place of good standing and the other would be killed soon after. And he said to the one who was going to live to remember him if his interpretation was right so that he could get him out of prison. And well, it was right and the one man was restored and the other was killed. But the restored man forgot about Joseph. But that was until a few years later, a few years, years later. And that'll be important in a bit. Where the ruler of the land needed, and the land was Egypt, needed a dream to be interpreted. So the restored man remembered Joseph and told the ruler of the land about him. Now uh, Joseph was then brought to the ruler where he interpreted the dream. And he said that the dream warned about a coming famine. 
So the ruler took um, his advice and prepared for the famine. When it came, the land was prepared and the famine didn't do all that much harm to them. Certainly would have been far, 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 far worse if Joseph had not been there. And then a few more things happened with reunification of family and so on, which aren't all that important to this illustration, but but which lead us to Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. And it's here that Joseph says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Pretty much everyone Joseph ran into, with few exceptions, either didn't care all that much about him, forgetting him quite easily, or intended to do evil to him. But this was all necessary. If Joseph hadn't been thrown into that hole by his brothers, he would never have been sold into slavery. If he wasn't sold into slavery, he would never have went to Egypt. If he was never in Egypt, he would never have been imprisoned. If he was never imprisoned, he wouldn't have been able to interpret the dreams of the two men. If he had never been able to do that, his ability to interpret dreams would not be known. And if that was the case, he would not have been there to warn of the coming famine. And if he didn't warn people of the famine, a lot of people would have died. So the story of Joseph is the story of one long chain of evil events, which led to someone or something good happening people tried to do evil things to joseph and god allowed those things to happen but he used those things for good this wasn't a short period of joseph's life this was years and years of horrible stuff happening to him this was so long that by the time he reunified with his family he had a new brother who hadn't been around at all who was now grown up to a certain extent not sure, I can't remember what the actual age of him was, but he was near enough a man. That's how long Joseph had been gone. He got a new brother, a new brother had been born and grown up to some degree or another. It was a long old period in his life. Now it is with this context that we return to Hosea. Hosea, who was likely very familiar with this story... Here's what God is telling him to do, and as we will see in the coming verses, he does it. He likely knew that he wasn't going to enjoy what was coming. At the same time, he knew that God is good, and that he doesn't tell people to do things just for the crack, from arbitrary nonsense. He doesn't tell people to do things for no reason, essentially. Hosea had an understanding of God that many people in the modern day lack. Today people are more happy, um, or more than happy, to praise God when things are going their way. But when things start going wrong, all of a sudden life becomes a competition to see who can turn on God the fastest. These same people who seemingly trusted God when things were going well lose their trust in him because things stop going well. People see the horror in the world today and say that either God doesn't exist or if he does he must be evil or he mustn't be all that powerful. Few are willing to consider that just like with the story of Joseph the bad things that happen in our lives are just as much a part of God's good plan as the good things. And that those bad things will ultimately lead to something good. Now, not every hardship in life leads to the same amount of good. It could lead to anything from an entire nation being saved from a famine, to a single person growing in maturity, to God being glorified. And all of those things are good. And I've seen Christians scoff at the idea that God would do things for his own glory. Which worries me, because I wonder if they know what kind of a God we're dealing with. And that's something I will talk about in a minute. Now this doesn't mean that all things are good. 
It doesn't mean that God makes people sin in order that he might be exalted in some way or that something else good might happen. What it does mean that even when we sin, God can use it in some way for good. Not because the sin is not that bad, but because God is just that good. What this verse also tells us about God is that he has every right to use people however he likes. People today are so individualistic. Everything must revolve around them. Even self-proclaiming Christians often only believe in their own view of Christianity because their view of it is warped. These people don't follow true Christianity. Instead, they follow a version of Christianity that promises not a God who saves them from their own sins and the punishment of their own sins and of his own wrath, but of a servant who saves them from general hardships and inconveniences. In this view of God, he is not king of kings and lord of lords. Rather, he is but a lowly servant, a butler, tending to the whims of the people who give the local pastor just enough money. This view of God is evil for so many reasons, we can't even get into all of them today. We'll get into a few. One of those reasons is that it allows people to be duped into making horrific decisions. Have you got a sick and dying child? Don't waste your money on a hospital bill. Instead, just come, give all that money to the local smiley church man. And if God deems it enough, he will heal your child. And if he doesn't deem it enough, then guess what? It's all your fault for not believing and giving enough money. Now, your choice is either let the child suffer on or give the local smiley church man even more money. E even if you have to sell everything you own, you better make sure he gets enough to please God. And now this scenario is both something that has undoubtedly happened in real life as well as a template. Switch out the part of the sick and dying child for any general hardship or even just minor inconveniences. And there you go, you've got the modus operandi of so many so-called churches today. Another problem with these churches is that they tend to love talking about how good God is. However, they don't like talking about the fact that being God, he can use his people however he wishes. He's not our own personal, hyper-expensive servant. He is the Lord God Almighty. He is sovereign over all. And that's another reason why this view of God is so horrible. It is incomplete. It lacks some of the things which make the perfect God perfect. God is good and loving and kind and so on, and we can all agree on that. But where the Bible and these churches start to disagree with each other is when the Bible says that God is holy, glorious, righteous, just and wrathful. These people are happy to tell you that God has a wonderful plan for your life. What they aren't willing to tell you is that that plan will almost certainly include things that you don't want to happen. They'll tell you that God is a calling for your life. But they won't tell you that God called Hosea, uh, Hosea to degrade himself by marrying a prostitute. Or that God called most of the apostles, including Paul, to both live and die for the gospel. They'll say God meant it for good, but they won't tell you what the ish in that sentence actually is. They'll say God is merciful and forgiving, but haven't got the nerve to say what it is he actually forgives. They'll tell you that Christ died on the cross, but they won't say why. They may say that it was to save people, but they'll never go as far as to say what he was saving them from. They water down the gospel. They water down God. All of this leads to people having a certain reaction when they come across passages like what we are studying today. We see God doing something that doesn't fit the modern watered-down version of him that we've become accustomed to. But that version of God is what people think he should be. So when they see the God of the Bible, they think, oh, that guy seems very mean. So for those not in the know, let me tell you about our God. 
This is the God who brought fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis. This is the God who flooded the entire earth also in Genesis. This is the God who incinerated Aaron's sons in Leviticus. This is the God who is here asking Hosea to marry a whore. This is the God who killed the people, two people, for lying in Acts. This is the God who sends sinners to hell. This is the God we worship. And that God can do with us as he pleases. Some people say God is evil because of what he does in the Bible. Imagine a five-year-old on the beach and this five-year-old builds a sand castle but decides that they're not happy with it so they decide to kick it over their own sand castle. Would, would you call that five-year-old evil? It would make more sense to call a finite five-year-old evil for doing what they wanted to a finite sandcastle of their own making, then it would to call the infinite God of creation evil for doing what he wants to his own finite creation. Here, in this verse, God is exercising his authority over his people. He is exercising his good and just a right authority over Hosea. Hosea may not like what he is being told to do, but God has every right to tell him to do it. We have no right to look down on God because he does morally correct things that we don't happen to like, especially when we do morally incorrect things all the time. A sinner has no right to look upon he who is perfect and criticise what he sees. It is an honour to be called by God. That doesn't mean you'll enjoy it necessarily. It was an honour for Paul to be called by God to spread the gospel. That doesn't mean he enjoyed his time in prison or any of the other horrible things that happened to him. It's okay to be unhappy with how your life is going. It's okay to not enjoy everything. But that doesn't mean we get to stop trusting God. So what's the application? Well, we see that trusting God is vital. We must all do it. Hosea trusts God and so he does what God tells him to. He does as he is told despite knowing that it's not going to be very fun or enjoyable. I must ask, do you trust God? If the answer is yes, when? Do you trust him in the good times and the bad times, or just the good times? Do you think he's no longer good when things aren't going your way? Or do you recognise that while bad things are happening, he means it for good? And do you recognise that that good that he means it for is not always personal gain on your behalf? I don't know who's listening to this. I do know one thing. You're a sinner. I know that because the Bible tells me it's true. And I have to ask you. This God that I've described to you. I don't care whether or not you like it. I don't care whether or not it appeals to you. You haven't got really many options here. There were plenty of people in Israel at the time who thought they had options. Who taught that if a new God came along they could worship him and he'd protect them. But those gods weren't real. The closest thing they ever had to a real God. Was a stone or a wooden depiction of a false character. Of a made up fictional character. There is one true God. The Lord of all creation. The sovereign over all. And he is just. And we will all stand before him someday. And so I must ask you. Are you prepared to stand before him? There's only two places after this. There's heaven and there's hell. There's no purgatory. There's no place you can go to pay for your own sins and then go to heaven. Either you go to hell and you pay for your own sins. Or you give your sins to Christ and he pays for them on the cross. And you get to go to heaven and be in heaven with God for eternity. That's the choice. 
I ask you, if you haven't already, to repent of your sins and believe the gospel. Here's the thing. Salvation is in God's hands. You can't choose to be saved. God has to choose you. But if he has chosen you, and if he has opened your eyes, repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is our only hope. I hope you enjoyed today's sermon. If you would like some other ways of consuming G Witch Ministries, then go to the links in my About section on my YouTube channel, and you will find my website, my TikTok, my Instagram, and my Spotify, where you can find either snippets of these sermons or the full sermons. If you would like to finance these sermons or help me monetarily, then you can also find my Patreon. You don't have to do this, but it would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching. God bless. And son of the